Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Today for Sunday School, we're talking about our relationship with God. And our relationship with God should be the most important. It is the most important relationship we will ever carry in this world, will ever have while we have breath in our bodies. It's our relationship with God that is most important. Our lesson for today is open the door. Well, let us go into prayer before we go into our lesson. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, God, for today's lesson, oh God, teaching us about our relationship with you, oh God, to increase, hallelujah, our stability and to increase, oh God, our foundation in you. Lord, we thank you for all of those who are watching, oh God. We bless you and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, our lesson title for today is Open the Door. Thank you, Jesus. In our books, in our Sunday school books, our focus thought says, we must open the door of our lives and choose unbroken fellowship with Jesus. Our scripture, our lesson text will be coming from Revelation chapter 3, and we'll be reading verses 14 through 22. Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 14, it says, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thy sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knoweth not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anointeth thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Verse 22 says, he that hath an ear, let him hear but the Spirit saith to the churches. Moving over to page 63, the title says, To the Angel of the Church of Laodicea. It says, In the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus asked John to deliver special words to the seven churches in Asia Minor. One of the youngest admonition, one of the strongest admonitions given to any of the churches was given to the church of Laodicea. It served as a clear indication as to how God feels about religion, what is marked by spiritual pride and apathy. And, you know, for those some, you know, there's confusion between empathy, sympathy, and apathy. But apathy means the lack of emotion or showing lack of concern. So it says, I'll read that again. It says, it serves as a clear indication as to how God feels about religion, which, which is marked by spiritual pride and apathy. So how God feels about saints that serve him in spiritual pride and without real feeling, real emotion or real concern. After reminding the church of Laodicea of his power and faithfulness, he gave them a very specific message, which was in verses 15 through 22. As with some of the previous churches, the Lord adapted to um, adapted his words to something significant about the city in which the assembly was located. In this case, Laodicea was known for its wealth and its manufacturing of special eye salve, as well as of a glossy black wool cloth. Laodicea was also located near Heropolis, famous for its hot springs, and Colossae, which was known for its pure cold water. The next section says, I know thy works. 
In verse 15, the Lord began by reminding them he knows not only the minds and thoughts of people, but he also knows their hearts. Because of this, God is the only one qualified to judge anyone. We cannot rely on achievements or accumulation of wealth for affirmation. Even one's heart cannot be trusted. And so let us get Jeremiah 17 and 9. I want to read that. So let us grab our Bibles and go to Jeremiah 17 and 9. So that sentence there, it says, even one's heart cannot be trusted. So Jeremiah 17 and 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Think about our heart for, for, you know, just for a bit. You know, has anybody ever fallen in love with somebody you know you should have never been with? You know you should have never, never, never started a relationship with that. Or you know you should have never continued in that relationship. You saw signs that it was time to get out. It was time to end it. But because of your heart, you said, well, I'm going to stick it out and I'm going to, I'm going to try to make it work. And even though this, even though that, now I'm talking about somebody you were unmarried to, because if you're married, then you, you do need to stick it out because you made a vow to God. But I'm talking about relationships w without being married, you know, um, boyfriend, girlfriend type of relationships where, you know, you, this, this didn't look good. It wasn't good. It wasn't a good situation at all, but still your heart was in it. And for whatever reason, your heart told you to stick it out and stay in there until finally you couldn't take it anymore. But it says even, even one's heart cannot be, cannot be trusted. Only God knows a person's true works. And to be a true believer, he or she must be spiritually vulnerable and sensitive to him. To be a true believer, we must be spiritually vulnerable and sensitive to him. So that's saying we must be vulnerable. We must be open to God. We cannot have guard. We should not have guards up with God. You can have guards up with man, but you cannot, you should not have a guard up saying, I'll only let God go this far. I only want to go this far and I don't want to do this. God tells me that I, I'm, he wants me to do this, but no, I'm not going to do that. We can't put guards up with God. We have to be vulnerable because he knows us better than we know ourselves. Both history and scripture warn that people have a tendency to reduce Christianity to a set of rules, rituals, or ideas instead of embracing a dynamic, heartfelt relationship with God. Even well-meaning believers can fall prey to reducing Christian faith to a religion. A.W. Towser put it this way, everywhere among conservatives, we find persons who are Bible taught, but not spirit taught. They conceive truth to be something they can grasp with the mind. There is no truth apart from the spirit. The most brilliant intellect may be imbecilic, when confronted with the mysteries of God. So it's saying the smartest person, when it comes to the mysteries of God, they're an imbecile. They're an idiot. They're, they're, they're foolish. They cannot understand. They are the most brilliant people. They know, I mean, oh my gosh, their minds, it's science things and math things and all of this stuff, all this worldly education. They have all these plaques on the wall and all these letters behind their names. But when it comes to the mysteries of God, the lesson says they're imbeciles. They know nothing. So we have to make sure that we are to the point of where spiritually, we have to be spirit led. We cannot be led by emotions. We cannot be led by what we think we know because we don't know everything. God knows all things. That's why we have to put our complete trust in him. It says, you are neither hot nor cold. In Revelation 3, 15 and 16, God made it clear he is looking for people with a passion for him. Apathy disqualifies people from being true Christians. Most people identify with an aversion to a limp handshake, a passionless kiss, an empty promise, or a half-hearted commitment. They are as pleasant as lukewarm coffee or room temperature ice cream. 
Lukewarm faith offends God because it reveals one's true feelings. So lukewarm faith is not passionate faith. It's not God is my everything. It's more of we say it with our mouths, but our actions don't back it up. We say that God is our everything, but truly if God was our everything, when, then we would do everything it takes to please him. So truly, God is not our everything. So we have become lukewarm. We have become to the point to where we are sometimes unconcerned with the things of God. God, God's word tells us to do it this way, but we make a decision. I'm going to do it this way. We make our own substitutions. The next section says, it says, I will spew you out of my mouth. To make sure his point is crystal clear, God declared, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. While this may sound like harsh language, one must remember our relationship with God is eternal. No relationship is more important. Our relationship with God has no room for ambiguity or compromise. Ambiguity is just saying our relationship with God has no room for us to be uncertain about it. We have to be convinced and, and have convictions about our relationship with God. And also ambiguity also means vague or more than one meaning, more than one multiple forms of meaning. So our relationship with God cannot have multiple forms. We cannot have split personalities. I, I, my relationship with God requires me to act this way at this point in time, but my relationship with God cannot control me over here. I act another way here. So we have to make sure that we are one way. We have to be saved at all times. We have to be faithful to God at all times. We have to be committed to God at all times, not just in the house of God or not just among the saints or, you know, but we have to be wholehearted and committed and faithful to God. And our relationship has to be number one to us even when we are behind closed doors, even when we are lo alone and we feel like there are no eyes watching, that's when our relationship with God is sound and real. When we can say, you know what, w when we are by ourselves, we can say, I'm saved. I can't do that. If I would not do it in the presence of God, with God's eyes watching, because truly he is and he sees all things. But we have to remind ourselves of these things because sometimes we forget that God sees all things. We forget that God, God's eyes are in every place. We forget that God can see in the dark. God can see through walls and God can see through closed doors. Many times we forget those things. So we have to remind ourselves, you know, the old saying says, what would Jesus do? But we also have to remind ourselves, what would I do if Jesus was right here? Because he is. But again, because we don't see him, then it falls in the back of our minds and we don't think about it. You know, would you, would we act that way if Jesus was standing right here? Would we say these things? Would we do these things if Jesus was standing right here? So as a mental note, we should start to say to ourselves, if Jesus was right here, would I do this? What would I do? What would I do? As a mental note to kind of remind us that we got to be saved at all times. Amen. All right. So the scripture, scriptures um, refers, the script, scripture refers to the church as the bride of Christ. As a part of the bride, individual believers are called upon to commit to God as dramatically as a bride commits to her husband. With that in mind, considering, consider the following scenario. Just say a 20-something woman who just said yes to her boyfriend's request for her hand in marriage. They're dying, she's dining with him at a seaside restaurant. Both of them are filled with anticipation and wonder as they discuss wedding plans and their dreams for the future. After lunch, um, after lunch and a shared ice cream cone, they stroll down the boardwalk, pausing and pausing at a seating area to enjoy the ocean view. In a moment of passion, she grasps her fiance's hand, pulls him close and stands on her tiptoes in a flagrant invitation for him to kiss her. To her dismay, 
Her fiance quickly steps backward, whispering, honey, not here. Everyone is watching. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, she smiles and tries to enjoy her continued, their continued conversation. A few minutes later, as they resume their walk, she reaches for his hand, only to have him recoil with a stern, not here. If you were that woman, might you wonder if you made the right decision to commit your life to someone who was not ready to display affection toward you in public? Would you marry someone who was half-hearted towards you? Would you feel good about your, coming, your upcoming wedding if your husband was uninterested or unaffectionate? It's sad to say, but Many of us, many saints, many Christians, we treat God that way. Oh, no, not in public. Oh, no, not now, not here. Oh, no, I can't pray in the grocery store. People are watching. This person needs prayer, but I'll pray for you later because people are walking around and it's embarrassing. People are watching. I can't display in public my faith. They ask you to pray at work and you're afraid to say the name of Jesus. So you just say God because I'm ashamed to say the name of Jesus because somebody might be watching or somebody might be offended. We have to be careful about these things. Let's look at a couple of scriptures on this. Um, first, I want to go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. It says, Whoso therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whoso shall deny me before men, him will I also de deny before my Father which is in heaven. Also, I want to go to Titus, Titus chapter 1, verse 15, Titus chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, Titus chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 say, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience, conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being, abom be, being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. reprobate. So in other words, it's saying, and to the pure all things are pure, but unto him, to them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and conscience, conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in their works, works deny him. And I said that earlier that we profess to be saved, but our works prove whether we are the children of God. Because if we are the children of God, then we will do the works of our father. We will look like our father. We will resemble our father, what we do, what comes out of us. Many times, you know, we, we can say, uh, I sound, somebody will tell us, well, you sound just like your mom or you sound just like your dad, or your mom used to say that, or we can say, you know, now that we're grown, that we remember things that our parents used to say, and now we hear ourselves saying the very same thing. Why? Because who they are is a part of us, and what we are used to, we mimic what we are around, or we mimic what we see. So when we mimic who we belong to, our attitudes and how we react to things need to be 
of our father needs to be, he should be the strongest role model that we have. Not the world, not the things that the world is doing and definitely not our flesh and the enemy, but we have to be led by the spirit. Our spirit, the spirit of God is our teacher. It is our schoolmaster leading us to Christ. So if the spirit of God is our schoolmaster, if we are being taught by the spirit of God, then we need to react. We need to live by the unction of the spirit of God. We need to look like him. We have to be careful not to deny God because if we deny God, he's going to deny us. And that's something we don't want. And in our ways, and now, one way to deny God is with our mouths. And, you know, I say, you know, when people are talking, I said earlier, when when you ask to pray and you don't use the name of Jesus, when you know that on a gen in a general congregation, in a general sense, the name of Jesus is what you use, but you so sort of change your words around depending on who you are around. Well, that is denying God. Yes, that's denying who you are. It's denying the truth of who you are. But also denying God is doing the things that are against God that we know that is wrong. Sinning is denying God. You're denying the fact that, you know, you say that we say that we are saved. We say that we love him. But he said, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. Then keep my commandments. That's what he said. So if we don't keep his commandments, then we don't really love him. So we have to be careful in our actions. We have to be careful. Page 64, the bottom section says, the Lord wants us to serve him with our whole heart. God has feelings too. He expressed his love for us by manifesting himself in flesh and dying on the cross. He has offered forgiveness of sins and eternal life to those who believe. But true faith will include spiritual passion. According to Jesus, the first and greatest commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Many things in life do not work unless they are done purposely and powerfully. We have all learned to avoid sluggish chainsaws and dull knives and sleepy drivers, inebriated pilots, and haphazard relationships. Few of us will settle Few of us will settle for careless surgeons or dirty restaurants or inattentive babysitters. Yet many settle for a mediocre relationship with God when it is the relationship we should be most careful and passionate about. So in other words, it's saying things that we find offensive, we avoid. Things that are a turn off to us, we avoid. You know, we don't want to use um, dull chainsaws or dull knives. Dull knives don't work well. You put in a lot of work, but it takes a long time to getting something done, to getting something cut. We don't want to be in a car with a sleepy driver. We are wide awake and alert when we know the driver is sleepy. We keep offering, honey, are you... I've said this to my husband, we've been going on long trips and I know he's tired and hey, I'm tired too. But if I feel like I may have a little more energy than him, I'd be like, honey, are you okay? Honey, you still okay? You want me dry? Lord, don't let me see him swerve over a line or something. Honey, you okay? You want me dry? You know, we are attentive about these things. Um, it says inebriated pilots. So if we know that the pilot of the plane has been smoking and drinking and doing whatever, then we're going to be like, oh no, I'm not getting on that plane. Oh no. Um, dangerous relationships. You see it and you're like, oh no, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. that is not the one for me. No, 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 no. It talks about, and few of us will settle for, um, few of us will settle for careless surgeons. So if you see it, sometimes if the surgeon don't even look right, we won't even, if we meet him before, you're like, oh no, bro, mm -mm, mm -mm. you're not going to cut on me. Um, dirty restaurants. You walk into a restaurant and be like, oh my gosh, look at this. They don't even clean in here. I don't want to eat here. There was one seafood restaurant or seafood store that we, um, that we had went into and I was like, oh, I don't want nothing from here. They don't even clean this place. Oh my gosh, look at the floor. So if the front looked like this and this is what everybody sees, if they allow the front to look like this, Lord have mercy, what does the back look like? 
that they don't care about because nobody sees that. So, you know, you think about these things. So it's saying the same care that we take for these natural things. Think of how we must be careful about our relationship with God. We cannot offer God just anything. God does not want to be, he does not want just anything. He asks for a complete, he wants a sacrifice. He just doesn't want any and everything that we throw up before him. We should be passionate about what we give to God. We should be serious about what we give to God, what we offer him. It says what we give to God, it demands total buy-in. Much like bungee jumping and skydiving. Like once you jump, that's it. You know, you, you totally committed. There is no callback. There is no, you know, jumping out of a, a plane. Once you jump, you can't, there's no need to think about rechecking your parachute. Because at that point, there's no turning back. You, you out there now. So all of that care should have been taken before you took that jump. You know, you should have made sure when you bungee jumping, I will ne I will never, but bungee jumping, you need to make sure that those straps and everything are on, right? You need to know, not just trusting the person, but I would say research it for yourself. So you know, okay, this need to go here and this need to be strapped across here because once you jump, there's no going back. So we have to take our relationship with God serious because once we close our eyes, when the Lord takes us and we take our last breath, there's no going back to fix it. There's no making sure we get into heaven after that. There's, we have to do it right and we have to do it right, right now. Over on page 65, it says, notice God does not reject anyone for lack of skill or gifting. His problem is not with status or performance. His concern has to do with one's attitude towards him. He is disturbed when someone puts confidence in things and accomplishments rather than in him. So believers do not have to worry about perfection of performance, but they do need to worry about sincerity. The Lord sums up his thoughts towards Laodicea in verse 17 when he warned, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So this is a profound paragraph right here. It says, we don't have to be perfect for God. We just have to be sincere and real before God. We have to be, our motives have to be right. That's what God wants. God wants sincere motives, not coming trying to trick him because we're not tricking him. We're only deceiving ourselves because God cannot be deceived. So we are not pulling the wool over God's eyes saying, oh, I'm saved. But then over here, I'm acting any and every kind of way. I'm doing everything. I'm doing, I'm acting all of the things that God lined out in the word of God that the saints should not be doing. That's what I'm going to do. But then when I come into the house of God, boy, I'm the most holiest thing you would ever see. We are not deceiving God. Mm-mm says, God is not mocked. What a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So we can't fool him. We have to be careful because all we are doing is fooling ourselves, thinking that we are fooling God. All right. So moving on, it says, you do not realize your true condition. So it, in that the last, um, when it talked about Verse 17 up in the top in the top paragraph, it says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. So we're thinking that we're good. We're just walking around talking about I have need of nothing. I am good. But in all actuality, we're full of sin. We're full. Of, we have we, we we're full of darkness and we do not live a Christ-like life. So we have to be careful. It says, it appears their self-sufficiency is what offended God most. When someone feels rich and in need of nothing, that person is deceived. It often takes a significant problem to remind us of our true state. Like the millionaire who hears the doctor say, I am, I am sorry, 
No amount of money can cure your disease. Or an athlete who hears a coach say, sorry, your injury is such that you will never play ball again. God wants to bless the lives of his people, but all their religion, but all their religious deeds, kind works, biblical education, accomplishments, or affiliation with good causes must never take the place of a dependent relationship with Jesus. So we can't cover up our relationship with God with all of these things that we do. I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this for God. But in actuality, our true relationship with God is not sound. It's not secure. It's not solid. But yes, we are busy doing all of these things, which is wonderful. It's fantastic that we're doing all of these things because we are helping someone. We are being a witness to someone. But in ourselves, it says, I, I can do all this stuff and I can preach to others and I can help others. But myself end up, I be a castaway because I'm not right on the inside. But I'm doing all of this. I'm preaching and I'm ministering and I'm going here and I'm going there and I'm feeding the poor. I'm feeding the hungry and I'm preaching to the poor and I'm taking care of this one I'm, and I'm giving to the poor and I'm, I'm doing all of these wonderful, great things. But on the inside, my real personal relationship with God isn't right. So I can be a castaway even though I have a long list of things that I do that's wonderful. So we have to consider our relationship with God. It says, wake up calls may be painful. Excuse me. Yes, wake up calls may be painful, but they can be restorative. To admit complete dependency on Christ is the starting place. So it's talking about wake up calls where God allows certain things to happen to us to get our attention. It's like, okay, I got to send an earthquake now because you're thinking you're walking on steady ground and you're not. But I love you and I want you to make it. So I got to send something your way to get your attention, to let you know that I need you to come up. I need you to believe in me. I need you to see me bring you out of something so that your attention can get back on me and not on those things. The next section says God called them to turn it excuse me, to turn to him. It says, Jesus was lovingly calling the church of Laodicea back to a genuine, back to a genuine faith and a genuine passionate relationship with him. In verse 18, he admonished them to buy gold tried in the fire with white raiment to anoint their eyes with salve. Their pursuits are the antidote, excuse me, their pursuits are the antidote to all the problems mentioned in the previous verse. The analogy of gold tried in the fire is clear. Not everything that glitters is gold. In order to be genuine and valuable, gold must be purified using high temperatures and chemicals. That question there says, how does God use life experiences to purify our faith? And I just said that, you know, he allows tests and trials to come upon us so that we can rely on him, then he delivers us, and then we magnify him and we serve him. Now, we have to be careful not to be in that, you know, in that continual state as the children of Israel were, God's people. God allowed them to go through things. He brought them out. They rejoiced. They felt good for a time. And then as time went on, they feeling good. They forgot about God and then they forgot to serve him. And they went right back to the murmuring and complaining and went back to their unpassionate worship. And so then God said, I got to get your attention again. You don't forgot me again. So here comes another test and another trial. Here comes another war, another battle that God did in themselves. They know, look, we're going to lose this one. But then God comes through and delivers and brings them out of it. And then there they are back on God. It's like a roller coaster. But we got to get to the point till we're off this roller coaster and we serve God with pure motive and consistent. God, want our, God wants our relationship with him to be consistent. Our love for him to be consistent. 
Um, as far as in marriages and relationships, we want our marriage, we want our love to be consistent. Don't love me today and then forget about me and you even forget you married tomorrow. Next, you know, we good this week, but next week, you don't even know if you married or not. You act in any kind of way. And then I got to go and do all this stuff and, and, and to remind you that, hey, I'm still here. You still married, hon. You know, God, look, we cannot treat God like that. God is not pleased with that. He wants us to know and he wants us to give ourselves completely to him all the time. It says white raiment speaks of purity as well. Later in Revelation 7, John described believers who made their robes white in the, in the blood of the lamb. The idea is that believers should settle for nothing less than a pure and genuine relationship with God. In Revelation 19, 8 says of Christ's bride, it says, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Finally, the Lord referred the referenced the eye salve for which the city was well known. He, the salve is analogous to God's spirit, which helps those who receive it see more clearly. The Holy Spirit's unction, like the ancient eye salves, first starts with conviction of sin, then it heals. So the, the Spirit of God, first, when, we, when we're in sin, we see it, we feel the conviction, and then we're able to be healed. When we feel that conviction, when we feel that pain, when we feel that hurt, when we feel that distance from God, when we feel that, oh my God, God is not pleased with this, I, just, I hurt him. It hurts him when we sin. When we feel that, we get to the point to say, Lord, I don't want to hurt you anymore. You died for me. I don't want to put you through this. You died once. And I, and I thank you for that. And I don't want to continually put you through that pain of realizing that, you know what? I don't appreciate that you gave your life for me. We begin to get further and further away from that sinful situation. It says, he opens our eyes first to ourselves and to our wretchedness, then to the Savior in his preciousness. The next session says, the Lord wants to be the source we turn to for everything. So while our culture may value its um, may value self sufficiency, it is not as notable as it may seem. God's people would do well to admit they are weak and He is strong. The path to abundant life begins with humility and can only be traveled successfully if it is done wholeheartedly. That question says, "Can you remember a loss, a sickness, or a tragedy that served as a wake-up call?" Reminding you of your complete dependency on God. So just think about it for a minute. Do you know, have, are you able to look back at something that you have gone through and you realize that, you know what? God allowed that because he wanted to get my attention. God was trying to get my attention. It wasn't that he was trying to punish me. It was that he was trying to get my attention so that I could get myself together. Why? Because he loves me and he wants me to get myself together. He doesn't want me to continue walking in my own path and end up going the wrong way. So he allows things to come. Just think, it just came to my mind, think of it like this. We're walking down this road. We know we shouldn't be walking down this road. So a lot, God causes a dog to come. Maybe there's a fence there. But we don't see the fence, so we don't know that the dog is blocked. But the dog comes barking, and we are afraid, and that causes us to change direction. Now, God is the fence. God is allowing that dog to only get but so far. It cannot jump the fence. It cannot consume us. It cannot devour us. But it's there to get our attention to say, hey, get over here. Get away from that because you are walking too close to danger. So he allows that danger. He allows something to come and scare us and to shake us, to get us back where we belong. That's what happens in life. God allows things to scare us, to shake us, to get our attention back where it needs to be. He chastens those that he loves. 
It says, hear my voice and open the door. Jesus ended his admonition in verses 19 through 21 with the following, a reminder that he chastens those he loves. A statement, a statement that he knocks on our heart's door and a promise that those who open their heart to him and hear his voice will have fellowship with him and will ultimately overcome. On a practical level, what does it mean to hear his voice and open the door? So let's look into that a little further. It says, God has spoken through a plethora of vessels and means, so various ways. We hear his voice by being willing to be directed, corrected, and motivated by his word, whether it be written, spoken, or imparted into us. So let's look at that just for a second. It says, God has spoken through many different vessels and means, many different ways. We hear his voice by being willing to be directed, corrected, or motivated by his word, no matter how it comes to us. So it's easy. We can say we can easily be directed by God's word because God's word will say something. We'll say, you know what? I can do that. We can be motivated by God's word. You know, God's word will come. We'll say, you know what? I got to get myself together. I got to start that. But many times it's hard. Sometimes it's hard for us to be corrected by God's word. Sometimes God word, God's word tells us to do something or to stop doing something that we are used to doing. So then it becomes a problem. Or just say it says God's word can come whether it be written, spoken, or imparted. So just think. When God uses leadership to send correction to us, many times people are, when it comes to giving direction, hey, do it this way. We say, okay, okay, that sounds good. Or we, you know, it motivates us. You're doing good. Just keep doing what you're doing. Okay, great. That sounds good. But when it comes and says, you know what? You're on dangerous ground now. You're going to have to stop doing that. You're going to have to stop or you're going to have to be sat down. You're doing too much. Um, that is not godly behavior. Something in us many times will buck up against it. And we say, oh, well, it don't take all that to be saved. So, so we have to be careful to make sure that we hear his voice, whether it be, again, written, spoken, or imparted. But we have to be obedient to God's direction, to God's correction, and to God's motivation. Receive it all with the same excitement. When you get direction from God, sometimes it can be exciting and sometimes it can be scary. Um, motivation. Again, sometimes it can be exciting. Sometimes it can be, it can make you nervous. But then correction, when it comes, we got to be ready to change. When God says stop, when that little small voice comes over you and says, you know what? That's not good for a child of God. That's not good. It's not good to feed your spirit with that. It's not good. Then we have to listen to it and correct that wrong. These words can come through any of the senses and through many modes, such as sermons, books, songs, and life experiences. Paying attention seems to be the key. The Laodiceans were so sure of themselves and so, pa and so passive that they were not paying attention. When God knocks on our door by speaking to us, we can open the door to him by being willing to receive his word. That requires humility and submission. Self-sufficiency and apathy block the heart's door from being open. So thinking that we have it all together and not really being concerned, it, it, can, it will block God. God cannot move in those situations. God cannot get through to us. Why? Because we think we already have it together. So we have to make sure that we stay vulnerable and open to God. Um, in a very practical sense, to open the door is to yield to conviction, to be quick to repent, and to be willing to change behavior and to be responsive to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. 
So these are ways that we can open ourselves up to God. How This is how we open the door. It says to open the door, it says we yield to conviction. We are quick to repent. We are quick to be willing to change the behavior and to be responsive to the prompting of the Holy Ghost. So when the Spirit speaks, we listen and we do what it says. While flesh will balk at some of these things. So flesh will say, mm, I ain't, uh -uh. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. That wasn't God. I don't know what that was. That was just something that I, that I felt, but I'm going to keep on doing it. Um, it feels good. I like it. It says, while flesh will balk at some of these things, opening the door will take believers places. God will take believers places will take, excuse me, opening the door will take believers to places in God they cannot get to any other way. Enjoy fellowship with the Lord. It says, Jesus promised the Laodiceans if they would adjust their attitude and open up to him, he would sup with them. In almost every culture, breaking bread with someone is one of the most intimate forms of, re of fellowship. How sweet it is to enjoy a Thanksgiving feast with the family or to take time to enjoy fellowship at a church picnic. There is something comforting about eating and fellowshipping with people you trust and love. Fellowship with God is available to those who set aside time to pray relational prayers. This amazing fellowship begins with recognizing our total dependency on God. There is a freedom in relying upon God for everything and then just enjoying his company as we pray. When we are completely sold out and transparent, we have nothing to fear and no reason to run from God's word. Vulnerability makes it possible for personal prayer time to be passionate and open. I'm going to read that one more time. It says, vulnerability makes it possible for personal prayer time to be passionate and open. The um, sentence before that, it says, when we are completely sold out and transparent, we have nothing to fear and no reason to run from God's word. So it's talking about our personal prayer time, being passionate and open to God. Personal prayer time, passionate and open to God. So the question is, is your prayer life dull? Is your prayer life dry? Is your prayer life boring? Do your prayers feel like a chore? It's just routine. Do you feel like you're just being made to do it? That's not passionate. That's not open. We must grow to a place where our prayers, our communication, our fellowship, our relationship with God is exciting. We get something out of it. We put our all into it. We have to get to that place to where we feel the anointing. We feel the power of God in our prayer life. We know that God hears us. We feel, now we know he hears us, but we have to be to, well, well, let me go back on that. Yes, God hears us, but is he paying attention to us? Because it says there are certain ways that we can live that we will hinder our prayers. God will not hear us if we are not living the right way. It says if our relationship is wrong with our spouse, if we are not, if our relationship is wrong, if we don't have the right motives, then we're just giving a prayer of repetition. We're just giving a prayer of just the same thing over and over again. We're not really into it. We're not really feeling it. And so sometimes God can say, boop, I'm just going to turn that one off. I'm just going to, boop, I'm going to turn off to that one because that's not a real prayer. That's that's just repeti repetition. That's just you saying the same thing over and over again, over and over again, over and over again with no true wholehearted feeling with no true passion, with no true drive, with no true motive. It's just dull. There's no true sensitivity there. There's no fervency there. 
You're not being vulnerable. You're not being true. You're not being open. It's just repetition. So there are times, you know, we've heard, you know, you know, you can get to a point to where we've heard it said that our prayers don't go past the ceiling. Well, we have to be careful that we don't get into that mode of our prayers becoming dull to the ears of God. We want God to hear us and to be open and receive our prayers. We want our prayers to float up into the nostrils of God and become that sweet smelling savor unto him. Not something that he hears and, oh, that's lukewarm. There's no passion in that. There's no real motives to that. You're just praying because you're praying because it's out of repetition. You don't really care what you're praying about. You just want to take up time to pray. It's not really real. We have to pray, Lord, get me to the point to where my prayers become real. I'm not saying stop praying. No, 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 no. We have to continue to pray. Stay there. Stay there until it becomes real. Don't pray for 15 minutes and get up. Don't pray for an hour and get up. If you, if you never really got there, you pray. You continue to pray until the spirit wakes up, until you feel it, until it becomes so real that God takes over. Pray until you hear God speaking to you, God imparting things to you, God saying, oh, wait a minute. You know what? Grab your Bible and go to this scripture. That's God leading and guiding. That's you actually communing with him. That's you having a conversation with him. It's not one-sided anymore. It's not just, I need you to do this. I need you to take Take care of this. I need you to take care of this one. Save this one. Fix this one. Get this together. Help me. Minister to me. Get me right. Lord, do this. Do that. Do this. Do that. But then give him time to say, hey, come out of that. Turn that off. Stop doing that. Start doing this. You know, sometimes you can get to a place in prayer to where you start hearing so much that you got, got to grab a pen and a piece of paper and start writing it down. Especially if you're the type of person that's forgetful and you're afraid that, okay, when I get out of this, when I come up, I might forget some of what was said or some of what was imparted unto me. So you grab your book and your notebook and you start writing. Make a habit of going into prayer with something that you can write with because how many things have you forgotten? How many directions have God has God given you in prayer? And by the time you got up and got busy with other things, you sit there and like, what did God say to me? And you, it slipped. The enemy, as soon as you got up, the enemy snatched it right out of you. That word that God put in you, the busyness of the day, the busyness of life, the cares of life, snatch that word right up out of you. It's good to write it down. It's great to write it down. So we don't want dull prayers. We don't want to stay there. Don't stay there. You don't have to stay there, but continue to pray. And as you pray, um, it's going to get down to internalizing and internalizing the message. It starts talking about how to pray, what to say. So we'll do a little bit more talking about that when we get there. But the last section here, it says we must open the door of our lives and choose unbroken fellowship with Jesus. It says those desiring closeness with Jesus might find it helpful to treat God much like a married person would treat a spouse with whom they wanted a deeper and closer relationship. It says a marriage counselor might advise them to set up daily meetings, plan dates, and work on being responsive to their spouse's needs. Their advice would also probably include the admonition to put their spouse first and try not to change them. Furthermore, something would probably be said about less nagging and more affirmation. What if believers put the same kind of effort into their pursuit of God in prayer? So what if in prayer, we, what if when in our relationship with God, we set up daily, daily meetings, 
set a time because, you know, we can get busy with life. We can get busy with this, that, and the other. The phone is always ringing. Somebody's always calling. Somebody's always texting. There's always something to do. You need to do this. You got to take care of that. The errands got to be run. The baby's got to be taken care of. All of this. You got to cook. You got to do all this stuff that you do. You got to work everything. So sometimes by the time we think about the Lord, it's at the end of the day when we're sleeping. And we have a couple of breaths left before we're about to pass out for the night. So how about we set up daily meetings? How about we plan dates with God? Lord, this is our time. This is our study time. I'm going to give this time to you. This 30 minutes, this half an hour, this half an hour, this hour, whatever it is. If you have nothing right now, then anything will help. If we don't have anything on the schedule, if you've got your daily to-do list and God doesn't come up anywhere on that to-do list, to start anywhere is better than having nothing at all. If it's five minutes in the morning, can grow to 15 minutes in the morning, can grow to 30 minutes in the morning, can grow, go to, grow to waking up an hour early to spend time with God before you have to get ready for work. Can, you know, 15, start somewhere. And then enjoy it. It's not a chore. You're feeding your spirit. You're feeding your relationship with God. You want that closeness with him. So it's not a chore. It's not dull. It's not boring. Make it exciting. Change your output. It's the enemy that tells us that our relationship with God, he convinces us that our relationship with God is just boring. Oh, church is boring. Oh, I don't feel like going to church. I'm too tired to go to church. Well, what do you do when you get there? Oh, I just sit in the seat and just pay, just listen. Well, you're not really doing no more than that at home. So why not just come to church? You're at least at, ho at home. You're not doing You're watching TV or you're doing this or you're doing that with your feet kicked up. Come to church. Pay attention. You know, but it's the enemy that says, oh, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. You know how many times we have said we are too tired to go to church, but yet we got our stuff together and went to the store. Hmm. So anyway, it says we can set up daily meetings. We can plan dates. It says, and work on being responsive to your spouse's personal needs. Work on being responsible, to, responsive to what God needs, what God says. Be responsive, be responsible and respond to him. Lord, if you want this, this is what I'm going to give you. Lord, if this is what you want of me, if this is what you're requesting of me, this is exactly what you're going to get. It says their advice would also probably include the admonition to put their spouse first, putting God first. God wants to be first and foremost. The Bible tells us that God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. And he wants us to put nothing before him. Don't put anything before him. All right. It says, and try not to change them. Okay. So put God first and try not to change him. You know how we try to change God? By giving him what we want to give him and expecting him to accept it. We expect that God is pleased with what we give when we are not really truly giving our best. We're not giving our all. Cain was upset because Abel's sacrifice, excuse me, Abel's offering was accepted by God and Cain's wasn't. Cain knew what he should have been giving God just like Abel did. They were both taught what they should be sacrificing, what they should be giving to God. So he knew just like his brother did, but he got so mad at his brother, that he killed his brother because his brother was accepted. In life, sometimes we get mad at saints because they're doing what's right and God elevates them. God is pleased with them. Oh, who they think they are. There they are up there again. Oh, pastor asked them to preach again. Pastor asked them to sing again. We're jealous because we're, God, is, God is the one that elevates us. God is the one that blesses us and moves us further. God is the one that gives us um, promotion. He promotes us. We don't promote ourselves. So because God chose to promote this saint over this saint, 
this one gets jealous and starts looking at that one in a certain way. Cain slew his brother. He killed his brother. You know what we do? We talk about him. Oh, she just thinks she all that up there. I ain't listening. Oh, who preaching? Oh, she thinks she all that. I'm not going. I'll show up late. Whatever. I don't even care. I'll show up in the middle of preaching just so I can say I came, but I don't support them because I should have been given that position. That should be me. That whole attitude of telling God who he should have picked, telling God who he should be pleased with, that whole attitude would disqualify us. Oh, God should have picked me over them. I'm better than them. I'm this, I'm that. Mm, that sounds like pride. Oh, and doesn't it say that God hates that? God knows the motives and God knows the intents of our heart. And somebody that talks like that, that sounds like their motives aren't right. Hmm. Pastor chose them and I, all I do for him. I do whatever he say. I do this. I clean the church. I do this. I do that. I do this. I do that. And he picked them over me. Well, I ain't doing nothing no more. Hmm. Okay. And we wonder why God is not pleased. Okay. All right. So it says, here are some practical suggestions as to what a personal relationship with God might look like. It says, make prayer first each day. Guard your prayer time and place. So guard your time. Make time for God and stick to it. Turn the phone off, lock the doors. Don't let anybody come in. Don't let anybody interrupt you. And your place. Make sure your place is somewhere that's out of the way that, you know, somewhere where not in the middle of the kitchen when everybody's running back and forth into, into the kitchen or not in a dining room when everybody's running back and forth. The TV's on. You get easily distracted. It says, pray conversationally, being honest with God about your feelings. So just talking to him. You know, you don't have to preach to God because God is the preacher. So you don't have to preach to God, but just talk to him. Plan personal prayer ret retreats, expecting positive feedback. Talk to God everywhere and about everything. Practically, as you rekindle your relationship with God, consider approaching prayer from a relational angle. You might find your prayers, including statements um, to God, similar to these. How are you today? What do you want me to do in my situation? How do you want me to pray? Let me tell you about my struggles and fears. I want to feel what you are feeling and care about what you care about. That's a strong one. I need you to wrap your arms around me and be my affirmation. The blessed hope we have is that when we open our hearts to God, he will come in. So we have to open ourselves up to God. We can't stand back. We can't put up guards. We can't just give God any and everything, but we got to open the door to him and let him in completely. He wants everything. He wants our all. And he wants us to be committed to him. He wants us to be faithful to him. And he wants us, uh, he just wants everything. So we got to get to the point to where, see, we have to remember that God knows. He said, I know thy works. I know thy works. He knows everything about us. So we have to know that God realizes where we are and what condition we are in. And we are not perfect. But we have to seek him. We have to seek him. And we have to, again, give him everything because we don't want to be lukewarm. We don't want to be that saint that says, I'm a saint, but yet we deny God with our actions. We deny God. Our actions don't say that we are saints. Let us be passionate about our relationship with God. Let us love him with everything we have. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your word today. Truly touching us, oh God. Reminding us, oh Lord, hallelujah, that you want us to open up to you. You want us to be vulnerable to you. You want us to be passionate about our relationship with you. That our relationship is should be number one 
It should be first and foremost, our relationship with you. Father, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. For your spirit, we thank you, oh God. Oh my God, even for the chastising that you've given us through your word on today. Hallelujah. Teaching us, oh God, that we have to be 100% and our motives have to be right. Hallelujah. In order to be saved, we cannot try to fool you. We cannot say one thing out of our mouth and do another thing in our actions, oh God. But Lord, we thank you for this word today because truly it is your word that reconstructs us. It is your word that restores us. It is your words, your word that gets us right. And if your word doesn't get us right, then we won't be right. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your grace and we thank you for mercy. Oh my God, we thank you. We love you and we magnify you. In Jesus name we pray and our soul says amen and amen. God bless you all in Jesus name.